Today we're going to be trying to get some path node overlap. <clears throat> this should be a fairly simple thing to do at first, but there are a lot of edge cases here that we're going to have to cover. So as always, we'll test the simplest things first and move on from there. The last thing that we did is I believe that in our faces, in our path nodes, we dropped this path node script onto each node. Oh, and we need to make each of these colliders a trigger too. Um, good old Unity doesn't allow us to have very good nested prefabs, unfortunately. So I'm going to have the fun, somewhat tedious task of activating each of these, selecting our nodes, and setting them to be marked as triggers. There we go. Mark them as triggers, apply while it's active, turn it off again. Okay, so let's just do a quick test run with our path node script. <clears throat> I'm going to use the unity message on trigger enter. And <clears throat> let's just do a print other dot name. And we're going to need an on trigger exit too. So let's make this a little bit more specific. Entering exiting Okay. So nothing at first, but I'm hoping that, okay, so we're getting nothing here. I really don't want a rigid body on every object because when we are, oh, let's just try adding face container. So this is our first face, our up face. Let's see what happens when we add a rigid body to that. Boom. Okay. So now you can see this rigid body attached to the cube face. We entered a whole bunch of triggers. Hmm. And you know what? Let's let's cut down the amount of faces that we're spawning. So we're only testing two faces at a time. So I'm just going to have an L path on the top here. And I think maybe what I could do is let's drop this down to one and then expand it again to six. Oh. Aha, here's an idea. Let's set it at two and then I'll set this to none and then expand it to six because it's just going to copy what the last item in the array is to fill out the array. I'm going to do the same here. Should be a little bit faster this time. So two, none, and then back to six. I do believe if I run this, we'll get some runtime errors. Yep. <clears throat> Argument out of range. Let's go and fix that quickly. So we can say if... Uh, current face is equal to null, let's just continue. Go right back up to the top of that for loop. Okay. Hey, oh, I, 
Hmm. Ah, current face is always going to exist. We're just looking inside the face dictionary. And the face dictionary is here, so we do always have six items in here. <clears throat> so, let's do this. Um, I'll do game object face prefab equals, and we'll grab from our array here. And now I can say if face prefab is equal to null, we'll continue. Let's, oops, move that. <clears throat> cool. That should get rid of our runtime errors. And... What is this cube's rotation? 90 on the Y. So we'll start out this cube core with a 90 Y rotation. I think that might be the wrong one. <laughs> oh shoot, that's funny. Um, <laughs> so we rotated the center cube. Whoop. And then we just place the face on top in the exact same way. Um, not exactly the solution I was looking for. So let's see, we're trying to test this out. Maybe instead of an L path face, we can use a straight path face. How does that look? Nope, that's also wrong. I guess we'll just have to do some rotating. That's fine. Let's put this back to an L. I'm testing with the L because, I don't know, eh, straight, straight. I'll test with the straight pass. Should be exactly the same. So the next thing we need to do is decide which game object is going to have our rigid body on it. And I'm kind of tempted to put it on the cube core itself. Um, let's remove this rigid body. We don't care about this rigid body at all. I mean, <laughs> this collider. No gravity. And this is kinematic. So for those of you who don't know, kinematic means the force that is applied to this game object through the physics engine is ignored. A great example, the one I always use of a kinematic object, is a floating platform in Mario, right? Because if Mario jumps on a floating platform, you don't want his force to push the platform downwards and have the platform start falling and spinning. Uh, that is not something that we want. So we're going to make this kinematic. The only reason I'm using rigid bodies, in fact, is so that my on trigger enter is going to work. Oh no! <laughs> we do need those colliders to click on them. Dang it! <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, box collider. Right. Let's put this back up here. Cube core. Okay, so it's got a box collider on it again. Good, good. It does have a rigid body now. Excellent. <clears throat> so you can see that the node. exited the wall.
entered the wall. No, yeah, entered the wall. Exiting cube core one. Okay, so this is a little bit of a problem. Let's put it back here. You can see here that this trigger is actually overlapping two things if we think about it from this perspective, right? It's overlapping the corner of our cube core and it's overlapping part of this wall. Now we only care if those cube or if these path nodes are overlapping other path nodes. So let's modify our enter and exit to reflect that requirement. So I'm going to get the component for the um, oh, path node. And I'll say if overlapped equals null. So if the collider that we overlapped does not have a path node Um, then we're just going to exit. And let's rename this to exited with control R, R. There we go. So now we shouldn't get anything until we hit the right. Boom. So here we have two things firing. <clears throat> First, the node on this one entered the node on this one, and vice versa. The node on this one entered the node on this one. And that's exactly what we want to happen. When they both realize that they're touching, I want them both to internally link to each other. And then when they break, I want them to unlink. So. Our path node is going to have a private path node, and let's call this linked path node. So here, linked path node is overlapped, and when we exit, We'll say the linked path node is nothing. And let's uh, let's serialize this for a moment. Just so we can use the inspector and double check what is going on here. So let's take a look at our nodes. Nice, so you can see that this path node is now linked to this path node, and this one is linked back to here. This is how we're gonna be able to tell when our Whitling walks onto a new cube, or if he should be killed, or teleported, or I don't know. Something bad will happen. The user will be punished if a Whitling basically walks off the edge of the world. So it looks like we have our nodes recognizing. Let's flip this one around. So now this node is connected to this one down here, right? That makes sense. We've flipped it around and they are touching. Okay, that seems to work fine. Let's test it with a L face. Good, we got two enters, two exits, two more enters. Cool, cool, cool.
Hmm, let's see. Maybe let's go to the drawing board, because there are a couple options. We've done the simplest option, which is nice. Um, we don't have anything pathing yet. And maybe we should do that first. Hmm. Oh, geez. So, I guess before we do that, I just want to talk about the other options that we have. So, we've got a cube here with my beautiful art skills. Oh, wait, how about this cube up here? Where's our first cube? Aha, perfect. So, this is going to be a valid path. <clears throat> I want my Whitlings to completely ignore gravity. That's one of their um, innate species abilities. And so, if a Whitling gets to this corner, and there is no other box here, right? If there's another cube here, the Whitling obviously can't walk down in between the cubes. So we're going to need some sort of system where each cube, this is like a top-down view, knows if there's an empty space next to it. And we need to do this in all six directions. Because I would like, in like a 3D cube space, I would like the Whitlings to be able to walk uh, let's go even further with it. The Whitlings should be able to walk a path like this. Straight L L straight L L L straight. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see the interesting kind of three-dimensional path finding that we're going to have to be doing here. And that's why it's really important for cubes to know if there are neighbors. So let's do that. Let's see if a cube has a neighbor. And this is our cube face spawner. I'm going to pull this cube face spawner into our... So this just spawns it. Let's just make a cube core script. And think about all of the things that our cube is going to need. And we'll apply this. I guess our cube core doesn't really need to know. Its face needs to know its direction. We can calculate the direction. Hmm. Let's just worry about neighbors for now. Oh, you know what? We're going to have to... Do we have to calculate neighbors at runtime? I do have an idea of cubes being able to translate based on like when certain certain levers are pulled or some action happens the cube will move from one thing to another hmm so let's just make a private function find neighbors So what I'd like to do here is let's raycast from the center to each face. 
And that would give us a line. So if I'm testing the right face here, I would draw a line from the center of the cube to where the face is positioned, and that will give us this direction, this ray. So that means we're going to need a, an array of faces. Or some kind of group of directions. Hmm. Let's just do it all right here. We can extract it later, right? So vector three directions array. New vector three of size six. Oh, whoa, wrong. Syntax here. Do do, and then this is an unnecessary equals. And I do believe it's up right. Basically, start the top, go clockwise around the z axis, and then I do front and back. So here's our array of directions. I'm going to restart Visual Studio so that the what's the word I'm looking for IntelliSense or the syntax highlighting is turned on. Not necessary, but I always like to have it on when I am streaming or teaching. <clears throat> Okay, so we're testing to see if we can find any neighbors. Um, let's maybe put this in private. And I'm kind of tempted to use a dictionary. Because I want to have my enum, where does that enum live? Cube face spawner. I want my enum to link up with the directions. Sort of like we did here. Actually, it's almost exactly like what we did here, except the... Except the distances are... half of a unit instead of a full unit. So maybe I'll just put a note here. Oh, jeez. Uh, note. Could this be combined with the cube face spawner data in any way? Yeah, we're going to need a dictionary. That's OK. And the value is face direction. Cube face direction. We definitely don't want an array of dictionaries. That seems a little bit silly.
There we go. So up, right, down, left, forward, back. And then we'll have these match up. Back, forward, left, down, right. Oh, up is already there. Very cool. <clears throat> and let's call this raycast directions. Can I make this a private constant? No. Hold on a moment. Maybe I can say constant like so. Nope. Okay. So in find neighbors, I'll do face index here. Raycast directions dot count. I don't know why I'm doing raycast directions that count. A cube will never have more or less than six faces. Fact of math. Okay, so hold on a moment. Jeez, oh, there's a lot of different ways to approach architecting this. Let's go to the drawing board. Always helps to have a penal, pencil and paper or some other equivalent. So I've got my core, and my core has six faces inside of it. And each of those faces, we know there's a group of meshes and a group of path nodes. But our neighbors are not going to change when we rotate. So that's an important distinction to make. Do the neighbors need to know what direction they're facing? Yes, I think they do. Um, let's see, the key is going to be, once again, our cube face direction. But we'll have a cube face, or... Oh, cube core. Yeah, because we're connecting one cube to another. Neighbor dictionary. And in a wake... Let's set our neighbor dictionary equal to a new dictionary. Very cool. Okay, so. Let's not do count here. 
I'm going to want to do cube face direction. No, let's just do six. <laughs> um, CFD current direction. We're going to cast this integer as a cube face direction. Now we're going to need to create our ray. And the origin is this transform position. And the direction is our ray cast directions at current direction. We're also going to need a hit object. And I'm only ray casting to other cubes. So let's serialize a layer mask, cube core mask. And I do believe last time we used number 10. Yes, that's what we want. So we're passing the ray. We're doing out into the hit data. Now the max distance is going to be really interesting. I think we should set the max distance to 0.51f. Because if our cubes are exactly one unit wide, and I want to know if there's another cube over here, I'm shooting from the center. So 0.5 would just go directly to the edge of the cube. 0.51 is going to go slightly past the edge of the cube. And hopefully, um, if there's another cube abutting it or right next to it, it will hit that cube and let us know that there is indeed a neighbor. And our layer mask is our cube core mask. So if it hit, we're going to say neighbor dictionary. For now, we're just going to add. Eventually, we're going to want to um, maybe just modify this. I'm going to get the cube core component from the neighbor. Otherwise, um, we're going to add the current direction and null. And then let's do a debug print. And I'm going to print out neighbor dictionary at current direction dot name. This dot game object dot name has the neighbor, the one we just hit. Oh, geez. Uh, let's put this up in here. Because if we added null into the dictionary, this is going to return null, and then dot name is going to give us a runtime exception. So we don't want that to happen. So this game object name has the neighbor of the current neighbor to the, <laughs> this is going to seem pretty silly at first, but I'm only testing. We don't really care about English that much. So this is going to say like to the up, to the down, to the forward. And in awake, let's call find neighbors. So we should get two things saying cube core. Oh, we got nothing. Oh, that's because our mask was nothing. Hey, oh, um, mask is cube core. 
来。So cube core one has the neighbor cube core, cube core to the left. That's not right. Oh wait, maybe it is. Yeah, the camera's over here. Ooh, okay. And then this guy has a neighbor to the right, which is also correct. Now all of these right, left, up, down, they're all set you know it doesn't matter where the camera is rotated these cubes have an understanding of this is world space this is how we relate to each other in world space and that's never going to change so flipping the world over spinning the camera around that's not going to change left or right or up or down let's make some more cube cores <clears throat> Let's do one up here, and then let's maybe duplicate this and put it to negative one on Z. Oh, hey. -oh. Let's try that. So cube core three has one neighbor on the forward. That's right. Cube core two has a neighbor to the down, that's right. One has neighbors to left and back. Is that right? Cube core one, left and back. And then our original cube core has neighbors to up and right, which is also correct. So we are able to find our neighbors happily. It's very good news. <laughs> There's a lot of pieces moving here already. Um, oh, let's test our spinning. So we got six entering and two exiting. It should be two exits, so they should go to four. Good. And awesome, this entering came up here. So, it's hard to see with our current camera, but you can see that our path here is connected. It knows that these two cubes are connected here. So, things are gonna get a little bit weird here. Are they? No, no, they're not going to get that weird yet. Hmm. So, yeah, that's our next test. So we've got our neighbors being found. And we're going to want to... If a cube does not have a neighbor and there are two overlapping nodes right here, then these nodes should connect to each other. And this connection is pretty much permanent unless another cube moves up from some other action in the game and ends up connecting with this cube here. These two are always going to be... Oh. Oh, no, they won't. They are not permanent. Because, imagine we have this cube like so. And then we also have some other cube right here with a path like this. So if I spin this cube this direction, now this path 
you spin it in your mind, is going to connect to up here. So let's let's break it down a little bit more. Um, so on cube rotate complete. I basically want to find um, for each node on the recently completed rotating cube. I want to find how many nodes how many path nodes that thing is overlapping? So I want to count our overlapped nodes. And the reason for this, you'll see in a moment. Things are going to get pretty weird if, for instance, this cube is gone. So the way I imagine this working is that the Whitling should be able to walk along this path upside down. And another path like so. So in this case, this uh, fanciful case that is an edge case, it should be possible. That would mean there would be one, two, three, four nodes in the same place. One node from this face and this face, <clears throat> and then one node from this face and this face. <clears throat> and all four will be on top of each other. That is the hardest case that we're going to have to deal with in this setup. But I think that the, set, the idea now for when a cube is done rotating, find every node on that cube and count the overlapped nodes. Ooh, and these are technically not neighbors, are they? Oh boy, I might need, instead of just six neighbors, I might need a lot more than that. Six, then we get four, six diagonals up top. It's, no, it's four diagonals. There's got to be eight neighbors. <clears throat> there can be... Eight cube neighbors. Let's double check that. We've got our cube in the center and it can technically connect to this one. It can technically connect to this one. This is just going to be sloppy because I'm going to delete them soon.
Ah, okay. I can think of an easier way to do this. So this is a two-dimensional cross-section of all the cubes that this can be connected to. And then what I could do is I can duplicate this up one unit and down one unit. And so you can see here that that's 12, 13, 14 possible neighbors. Ugh. I don't know how much I like that. Let's delete these. Nope, I want that one. Let's move him up on the Y. And let's give them... Is it going to be possible to give them all straight paths? Let's just try two of them at first. So I'm just going to keep adding straight paths until I can get that um, that crazy set up there. How about two on each? That should be enough. Should be sufficient. Nope, <laughs> I don't think it's sufficient. <laughs> Okay, all straight faces. Let's see how this goes. I think it still might not work. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's give it a shot. Oh, oh, it did work. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let's clear this out. Nice. So you can see there were eight exits and eight enters. Wow. That's a little bit shocking. Eight. So this one entered two, this one entered two. Okay, because they're still overlapping already. I see, I see. How about when we just start? Do we get a bunch of enterings? No, we don't. So we know that if only two nodes entered, then we have successfully connected a simple path. Hmm.
Hmm. <laughs> a little bit stumped on what to do here. There's a lot of options where I could go with this. So I need to ask myself, what is the simplest thing that I can test? Okay, so instead of doing all this craziness with um, spawning these faces, we know that this face spawning works. We know that cubes can see that they have neighbors. Let's double check that. Always test and retest. Okay, yep, they found each other. That's good. Let's start creating a begin piece. And instead of having um, negative one, instead of having this cube face spawner, I'm just going to drop some path faces on here. Let's rotate around this Y90. Nope. Negative 90. Let's add an extra bit of code to our cube rotator script. Oh, you know what? We can just remove selectable and by removing selectable it means we shouldn't be able to click on it anymore oh oh my let's remove the cube face spawner as well Okay, cool. So we're getting a null reference exception, but now we at least have a starting point. Let's fix that. We shouldn't even get into this cube select function. I think that's from our mouse controller. So let's make sure that this is indeed a selectable cube. There we go. Nice, no errors. We can spin our guys around. Doesn't actually deselect anything. We can come back to that problem later. Do, 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 do. I think what I'm going to do, uh, let's call it a day for now. I'm going to think about the logic required to get all of these connections working. I've done it once before, but it was a long time ago, and I totally lost all of that code. So, uh, thanks for watching. My name is Billy Lemonzest, and I'll see you probably again later tonight.